a way to start the service. Hallelujah. Come on. How y'all doing this morning? Man, it's a good day to be here, ain't it? Man, hey, if this is your first time here at Living for the Brand, I, I want to say welcome. And uh, if you would, if you don't mind, just slipping your hand up. We want to put a card in your hand. If this is your first time here, just put a little card in your hand, and we just want you to fill out just a little bit of information. And then as you're heading out the door, on the left-hand side, we have a welcome booth there. And you can exchange that card for a bag. And in that bag, there's a lot of information about the church. There's some cookies in there. And you can take that with you. And uh, hopefully that'll answer uh, all of your questions that you have about the church. If not, you can call up here and we can uh, answer them some more. Okay, so I just want to say this. If you're bored this week, it's your own fault. So let me tell you what we got going on this week. All right? This afternoon... Right after church, we have a fall festival meeting. And so if you want to be a part of the fall festival, uh, it's going to be right after church in the old sanctuary. Then this afternoon, uh, we have our second play day. And so if you're in the play day, you want to come watch some kids have an absolute blast. Uh, come up here. The lead line starts at 1.30. All the other classes will not start before 2 o'clock. Uh, Tuesday, we're going to be team roping. And so be sure to be here for that, our service uh, it starts at 6.45, kitchen opens up at 6, uh, we'll start roping the dummy at 5.30. Then Friday night, we got a jackpot roping. Then Saturday, we have a bluegrass band, it's completely free. You come on out here, it's going to be outside in the arena, it's going to start at 6, uh, it's going to be a really, really, really good time. So like I said, if you're bored this week, just come on up here, make sure you grab a bulletin, as you're heading out the door, if you don't have one, and there's going to be plenty of stuff going on, but uh, there's water in the baptistry, y'all. We're having baptisms today. Hey, where's Miss Sue Perry at? No, she's not here. Anyways, her birthday was yesterday, so if y'all see Miss Sue, y'all be sure to wish her a happy birthday, but let me pray for us now. Lord, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you uh, for who you are. God, I thank you for what we get to do. God, I thank you for the excitement that we get to have, this hope and this peace that we get to have that only comes from you. God, when all this whole world around us seems to be crashing down, and when it feels like everything is going the wrong way, we can rejoice in you. And Lord, I pray over this service, God, be with the band, be with Brother Dale, and Lord, help us to look like you with everything that we do. And it's in your name, amen. Hey, I got one little teaser for Christmas time. We have some really exciting stuff coming up, and so y'all need to be prepared for what's to come around Christmas time. But y'all get up and shake somebody's hand. Go ahead. Go. Go. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Little, little light from heaven filled my soul. It made my heart in love, and it wrote my name above. Just a little talk with Jesus makes me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our pain and cry. He will answer my mind. When you feel a little prayer will turn it, you will know a little fire is burning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes you right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears. Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. Well, I go to him in prayer, and he knows my every care. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Let us have a little talk with Jesus Let us tell him all about our troubles He will hear our faintest cry And he'll answer by and by When you feel a little prayer with turning You will know a little fire is burning You will find a little talk with Jesus Makes it right Have a 
little talk with Jesus. Let's tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our famous cry, and he'll answer by and by. When you fail, a little prayer will turn, and you will know a little fire is burning. We'll find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. One more time. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our famous cry. He will answer by and by. When you fail, a little prayer will turn. You will know a little fire is burning. And you'll find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. I want to. I want to just make you aware of something that's going to be coming up uh, this next month. We are having a birthday party. This year is our twentieth year as Living for the Brand Cowboy Church. When I, yeah. So, on the, on the 25th, I think that's right, of next month, we're going to have a birthday party. And what we're going to have is regular services. You'll have Sunday school, regular services, like we always have. And there'll be a message. There's also going to be some things related to our past, to our history. And then also we'll go from there and we're going to have a catered meal that will be out in the arena and we'll eat. Uh, Miss Elizabeth's in charge of that. I know she was getting prices on barbecue. If you don't like barbecue, uh, you need to call her, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and we're trying to make it to where we're not going to have our people tied up with, with preparing and bringing and all of that. Uh, so it's not going to be like a potluck. It's going to be more of a catered event. We'll have special music that day. We'll have special uh, testimonies from some of those that were here when the church started. It's going to be a great day. Amen. And so I want to encourage you to just mark that on your calendar for the 25th. You'll be hearing more about that this next month. But uh, we're going to have a birthday party. And it, it's... It's really a birthday party to honor Jesus. That's what it's about. And so those of you that are here today, be sure you tell those who aren't here today, we're fixing to have a birthday party. Okay? God bless you. At the mention of His name, Lives are changed In the midst of life's temptations He's there to see us through This man of which I speak Is here today for you and me His name is Jesus But you can call him as you please they call him Manuel the king of all kings he's the son of the father he's the prince of peace they call him Hosanna the lighthouse at sea to me. Many times I've called His name, prayed for forgiveness when used in vain. There's a peace in knowing that His forgiveness stays the same. The most famous in history, things He spoke, the whole world still reads. His 
name is Jesus, but you can call him as you please. And call him Emmanuel, the King of all kings. He's the Son of the Father, the Prince.
was on death row Guilty in the first degree Son of God hanging on a hill Hell was my destiny The crowd was shouting crucify Could have come from these lips of mine The dirty shame was killing me it would take a miracle to wash me clean Then I read red letters And the ground began to shake Lightning through my veins My dead heart began to beat Oh, the breath of God, it filled my lungs And the Holy Ghost awakened me Yeah, the Holy Ghost awakened me His only son to die for me, his arms spread wide for the whole wide world, his arms spread wide where mine should be. Jesus changed my destiny. good oh what a good crowd let me tell you I've had quite a morning really um, yesterday we had a wonderful time there was a group here we I think the last count I heard was about 44 people that came to the live stream of the prayer march that took place in Washington DC and it was a great time but it's two solid hours of praying really um, different spots where they would pray and we would pray in here. And so uh, God just really got a hold of me about what I was preaching. And I had a message all together. I had my PowerPoint already sent to Barbara and Jim and I uh, had everything lined up that I was going to do and went home. I had to help my grandson last night work on something till about 9 o'clock and I came in and and ate supper, and then I went on to bed. And this whole time, I'm, I'm making a case for God and saying, now I've already got all my notes together. I've already got the PowerPoint. 
I already know it's in, it was in the series of Paul and what we've been doing all in line. And this would be out of the norm. And nothing really is harder to do for a preacher than to really know what to preach. I mean, think about it, folks. you got the whole Bible. I mean, you, you choose a message from the Word of God and you have the whole Bible to preach from. And so I, the way it helps me is that we do series. We do series about people. We do series about events or whatever. And every pastor struggles with that. Now, a good friend, David Dykes, it's in Tyler. Uh, he, at one time, uh, told me he had his messages laid out for a full year. Uh, exactly what he was going to do for a full year. Of course, they have TV production and all these other things that he contends with that I don't have to. And, uh, and that's fine. A lot of pastors do that. And God's in it. God knows one year, in a year's time what he wants you to preach, and he can tell you then if he wants to. That's just how it works. Well, I don't have that. Uh, I've, it helps me to be able to know in advance what I'm going to be preaching or, or the, the subject matter. I may not know the exact text. Well, God began to deal with me. And so I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Amos, the book of Amos, chapter 6. And God changed my message because of really the influence of my heart yesterday as we were in prayer time and as we were going through and they were stopping at the different spots there on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., and uh, the, the different spots had relevance to what we need to pray for in our country. And these are things that we've all been praying for anyway. But I'm telling you, folks, God got a hold of me yesterday that we're at a crossroads. We're really at a crossroads in our nation like I've never known. I've preached 40 years. I've never seen this. I've never seen such opposition on both sides. And I've never seen such ungodliness that has erupted throughout our nation because of I be what I believe is uh, pulpits, uh, governmental leaders, those people that are in the media that have influence over great numbers of people, and how we have seen a great division that has happened in our country. And our country is in peril right now, and if things do not straighten out and the only way that we it can straighten out is with God he's the only one that can do it Amen. and yet you have a whole generation of people that don't even believe in God and so how did we get to this point and has it ever happened earlier in history well it has and it happened to the nation Israel Amos was just a typical guy he wasn't anything special. He was just a layman there in Israel. But Israel had already gone through David and then Solomon. And this great wealth and tremendous blessing that God had poured out on that nation. And then when Solomon came in, Solomon brought in, we know, all of the different concubines and wives from all over the world, really. And they brought in their pagan gods, and God said, I'm going to judge Israel because of their sin. And so the gener he said, but I won't do it to Solomon. I won't, I won't take, rend the kingdom from his hand because of what I promised David. But the generation to follow him, he will never sit on the throne again. Now David's throne, we know the Lord Jesus Christ one day will come and be seated at the throne of David in the thousand year millennium. I've taught all that. But this is that period of time right when they're fixing to go into exile. Assyria, they're going to have a civil war. They're going to have a division. They're not going to be unified. And then God's going to bring judgment upon the nation Israel. And He does it first with the ten tribes to the north that go to the north and the Assyrians came in and captured it. And then later on, the tribes that remain in Judah or in Jerusalem, they will be taken by the Babylonians. And there will be a delay in that judgment. But either, both of them were the judgment of Almighty God upon a nation. Now how does that happen? Well, the Bible teaches us we have individual sin. And every one of us struggle with that every day. 
Everyone in this room battles sin daily on a, on a, in a daily way in your own personal life. And God judges us because of our sin, but it's usually dealing with us with conviction of the Holy Spirit and with us as individuals with our sin. But when a nation, when a society comes to the place to where they embrace sin, when a society comes to the place to where they make it a matter of their governmental order of sin, then God judges a nation. He's done it all through time and He'll always do it. Even the United States of America. Most of the time, we don't like preaching on judgment. Amos didn't either. He was just a common guy and God gave him a very uncommon message. And he preached that message to the nation Israel. In the midst of that message, he gives them six things that they had going on in their government, in their society, that he said, God's going to bring judgment on you. And that's found right here in Amos chapter 6. And look, if you will, with me. We'll start off in verse 3. Look at what he says. Anytime you see the word woe, it's not because he's, well, it may be, uh, he's driving a team of mules, you know, and he's saying, Whoa! Well, Amos is saying, Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who cause the seed of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out your couches, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock, calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent to yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. There they shall now go captive as the first of the captives, and those who recline at the banquet shall be removed. Now the last part is his judgment. He's pronouncing God's judgment. In verse, verse 7 he says, it's therefore. Remember, you find out what it's there for. Therefore they shall now go captive as the first of the captives. And those who recline at the banquet shall be removed. He brings a judgment upon Israel and he tells them, because you have gone away from God in these six areas, I'm going to bring judgment upon a nation. And it's a nation that was his chosen nation. Israel was his chosen people that he wanted them to reflect Jehovah God. And as I've taught you as we went through the the. Uh, the messages on Paul that Paul said there was a gospel. Well, that gospel was also with the Old Testament. It was by faith you trust in Jehovah. And Israel was given that gospel to preach. But yet they as individuals had moved away from that at the time of Amos, so he comes with this proclamation, you'll be the first that go captive. Now what are these six things? Watch. He said, first off, you have no regard for judgment or no regard for the judgment day. Look what he says in verse 3. Woe to you who put far off the day of doom. What is that? That's the judgment of Almighty God. And then look at what he says as a result of it. Who's caused the seat of violence to come near. You see, folks, what Israel had done is they had taken a judicial system that God had given to them all the way from the time that Moses had the Ten Commandments. And by the way, folks, they aren't the Ten Suggestions. They are the Ten Commandments. And if you heard Diane Feinstein as she talked to, to this, this judicial judge that, is fixing, that has already been named by the President and now may be seated on the Supreme Court, if approved, she said, I don't like your dogma. Do you know what dogma is? It's when somebody's dogmatic. It means that there, is, there are moral absolutes. And folks, we have had judges on the court that did not believe you had moral absolutes. 
You could have same-sex marriage. You could have abortions. You could have anything you wanted to because there's no moral absolute. And they interpret the Constitution as however the Constitution fits our society. They saw what was good in their own eyes and they did what was good in their own eyes rather than the eyes of Almighty God. Our forefathers established our Constitution based upon the Word of God. And there are absolutes to the Constitution. What Dianne Feinstein didn't like was the fact that we had a judge that was fixing to be an appellate judge who now has been named as our Supreme Court nominee. She had dogma. That dogma was based upon what? Her faith. She believes in God, and she believes in the God that founded the nation, which wrote the Constitution. And what's the Supreme Court justice supposed to do? Not rewrite the Constitution. They are to interpret the Constitution based upon whatever law is coming down. And that's the checks and balances that we have. Do we need dogma? They didn't have it in Israel. And what does it do when you do not have a justice system that is actually showing us that God one day is going to judge? That's what they're for. That's what our law enforcement is for. That's exactly what our judicial system is for. It's to warn those who, do, who want to live lawlessly that they will be prosecuted as a picture of one day they will ultimately be prosecuted. Israel had moved away from that. And what did it cause? Look at what it says. The end of verse 3. Whose cause this putting far away this judgment, the day of doom, who caused the seat of violence to come near. You want to know why our cities are burning? You want to know why we're having problems with lawlessness? It's because we have had for decades now a judicial system that has not had absolutes. They've removed God from it. And when you do that, then you are welcoming in that person who is lawless and says, See, there's no God. I can live any way I want to live. And if I want to burn down your business, I'll burn it down. And you better not try to stop me or you'll be prosecuted. And that's what has happened. The second thing he says, no restraint sexually. Look at what he says in verse 4. Who lie on beds of ivory. Stretch out on your couches. Now I've preached on this before concerning sexual sin. But he talks about these beds of ivory as being in the very, the very affluent of that society in Israel. And here they are with no restraints whatsoever when it came to their sexuality. Folks, when you look at this and you see it, that's exactly, listen, the transgender movement, homosexual movement, is one thing. It's simple. It is when a person comes to the place, the Bible teaches this, it is when a person comes to a place when they do not acknowledge God as God, Romans 1, then they give, God gives them up to a reprobate mind to do those things which are unseemly. Men with men and women with women. He even talks about it. And when we as a society have come to the place to where we have embraced it, from our judicial system, to our Congress, to our media, to our households. And we're saying it is a normal lifestyle. They are born that way. That is straight from the pits of hell. And there are many people in the church today that believe that. Let me tell you, it's a choice. They are choosing to say, God, you will not tell me how I was born. You'll not tell me what I am. If I want to be a girl, I'll get up there and be a girl. And nobody should say anything about it. It ought to be against the law that anybody says anything about it. And if a church doesn't want to hire a homosexual, you should force a church to hire them. It has come to a place to where they have so rebelled that they have reached a point to where now 
not, God's not judging because of them. Their judgment will be there if they do not trust Christ as their Lord and Savior. He's judging a nation because they come to a place to where there are no restraints sexually. Anything goes. Where does it stop? You can't stop at pedophilia. It can't stop at anything because they were born that way. It can't stop in any type of sexual dogma or moral absolute because God created them equal with everybody else. They did. He did. And believe me, every one of us have a nature within us that if we let sin be unchecked and unbridled, we'll go there. That's how wicked we are. But I'm telling you, America has come to a place to where, just like Israel, there was absolutely no restraint sexually. The majority of the world's pornography is manufactured in the United States. 90% of the consumption of, homos, of uh, pornography in America, 90% is consumed by Americans. That means only 10% of pornography is viewed around the world. The rest of the world. 90% of it that's manufactured, and a huge percentage of it is manufactured in the U.S., is consumed by our own, own nation. It's a world problem because of us. And God is not going to sit back and let a society have unbridled, unchecked sexuality and turn around and say, it's okay. It's all right. Man, it's getting heavy in here. But it's true. It's where we are. Here we see the third thing, and that is reservation for the future. Look at this. Who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out, their, stretch out on their couches. Now, watch what he says. Eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. Lambs and calves. Now we got ranchers in this room. What happens if you eat all the calves out of your herd? I don't know how many sheep farmers we have. Have we got any people that are goat herders in here? You want to raise your hand? Oh, good. But if you eat the lambs, what happens? The older ones get old and die. They don't reproduce. You got to have the future. You got to have the young and the lambs to be able to have a flock later on. And so, what do they do? They have no regard for the future. Have you seen our national debt lately? And that's not Republican or Democrat. Man, our, our government is out of control spending. Why? Because they're trying to provide all this stuff for us. And we don't have any regard for the future. And what happens is, our generations that come after us, because we're just consuming the things that they should have available to them to reproduce, we just let it go. All in the name of economy, all in the name of whatever. But that's not the problem. It, God can bless us financially. Listen, folks, money has never been a problem with God. Never. I've told you that and told you that. For nine years. God's not a God who, who focuses on money, but He uses money for His kingdom. Jesus had those that donated to His ministry, and Jesus had those that provided for Him financially. If He didn't have the money to pay the taxes, what did He tell Peter to do? Go back out there and go fishing. The fish you pull up, reach in their mouth, and you're going to find there's money in there. I just made more fishermen in this room than we've ever had. But you know what he's really showing you? You be a fisher of men. We don't have financial problems here at this church, and I'm not saying we won't ever have. But I'm going to tell you, we don't have financial problems because we don't have a... It's not because of us. It's because of God. And when God blesses the church, He blesses the church even financially so that we can accomplish ministry. And we're not, we're not a savings and loan here, but we do plan for the future. 
It's okay for you to have a retirement account. It's okay for you to look to the future and what you have. But when you get to a generation and you get to a whole society where they're saying, we don't care about our grandkids, we're going to do what we want to do, then you have a problem with God coming down and saying, wait a minute, you need to provide for the future. I'll give you a good, good example. We built this new auditorium. I mean, it's not brand new anymore. We put a new arena roof on. Folks, I gave to that. Me and Mitzi gave to that. Many of you gave to that. Some of you have come in since it was built, so you didn't give to it, but that's okay. What happens is you have a generation of people that say we're doing this not just for us, but we're doing it for the future. See, our grandkids will use this room. Our grandkids will be able to use that arena roof out there in that arena. Now, you always have some because I hear them, and they tell me. We shouldn't be spending that much money on this stuff. It's not about us. It's about them. Man, when you, when you look at where Israel had come, man, think about their history. What, look, man, they, they would... Look, man! They, they, they would look, and they, have all this, they had all this stuff. But in their very nature, in their very history, what did they do? They told the future generations they had to memorize the Scripture. And they did. When they had their bar mitzvah, what did they do? They had to come in. Many of them, in their early days, had to quote the first five books of the Bible. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. <laughs> Can you imagine memorizing that and then quoting it back to the family? They would always have to remember the, how the Red Sea and how the nation Israel came out at the Exodus. They would have to rehearse that. At every Passover, they would tell the story. What were they doing? They were teaching future generations. Missy and I both have grieved, grieved, over what kind of job we must have done with our kids and grandkids and with our future grandkids, <clears throat> they have a totally different concept. And I'm not up here criticizing my kids and grandkids, and I love them with all my heart. But that generation, their view of God, and their view of church, and their view of what it's for, it's weird. It is. It's weird. Now, I have some hope because I see the future generation and the young people that are in this room and the people that I see that are from the kids that I'm telling you, we got a whole group of them that are coming back to worship. Wayne, they're coming back to worship. Now, it's not like we do it. But they're coming back. They're seeing what is happening in our nation. They're seeing what's happening in their generation and I'm telling you, they want something different. They want God. And it's our generation that has to tell them. So what do we do? We've got to come up with ways that we can communicate the gospel with them to show them it is our heritage, it is our hope, it is our future. And that's the Word of God and God and worshiping Him. Praising Him for who He is. Israel had fallen away from that. All they did was think about, think about their generation and what was going on. They had no reservation for the future. They had no restriction for entertainment. Look at this. It says, Who sing, verse 5, Who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments, and invent for the, yourselves the musical instruments like David. Entertainment. It had become a major issue in society in Israel. Entertainment. Well, the other day I pulled up at what used to be Kid Jones. They sold out. And most of theirs are going to be 7-Elevens. But if they already are, they just hadn't changed the name of it and stuff. 
But I pulled up, put some gasoline in my truck. Hadn't weaned it yet. I've been working on that, but it doesn't work. And this guy pulls up. He's in a car. It doesn't matter what color he was. But he was listening to what he would call music. <laughs> and it, it had no melody. It was just beat and rap. But I started listening to the words. And the words were describing a sexual event in gross description. He was playing it loud enough that the whole block could hear it. Had a big old boom box in the back of his car. I know he did because the whole car was vibrating. <laughs> and he was sharing his entertainment with the whole world. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Well, fortunately, he drove off. Because <laughs> y'all know me, I'm so, I'm so mean, you know. But I did think about it when he left, and I thought, we've got a whole generation that's like that. That's their form of entertainment. And let me tell you, America, our entertainment industry, all you had to do is watch them over the last four years and you find out exactly where the core of their belief is. And I'm telling you folks, a lot of it is straight from the pits of hell. There's some of it that entertainers, praise the Lord, have taken a stand. Now they've been completely shunned by Hollywood, but they've taken a stand on the issues. They've taken a stand on all of the major things and they came out of the entertainment field. Pray for them. Rejoice in the Lord with them because I'm telling you, they are far and few between. Entertainment industry is one of the dearths of America when it comes to the judgment of God. And Israel had done the same thing. By the way, entertainment, that's what they call the NFL. You know, I boycotted the NFL when they started kneeling with the national anthem. This year, if I could cut them out of the news and off my TV, I'd do it. Same way with the NBA. Same way with the rest of sports. When they begin to bring politics into sports, I don't want to see it. Because it was a form of entertainment. Not anymore. Now I have to say, I do watch college football. <laughs> I'm not obsessed with it. I mean, Arkansas, I just wanted to see how badly they lost. That's the only reason I watched. But... Folks, entertainment industry, guard your TV. Why? Because it's a way of guarding your heart. We allow things to come into our living rooms, folks, that we would never allow to happen in real life. But we let them come right into our living room, even on commercials. And there's no uproar, there's no restraint, none whatsoever. We just go ahead and do it. And I'm telling you, it makes a difference, though, in how God looks at our country when a society has come to that place. Here's the last one. Excuse me, next to the last one. No reasoning in intoxication. Look what he says in verse 6. Who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments. Now again, the best ointments is talking about they're extravagance. But drinking wine in bowls? Now, folks, I went to the University of Arkansas when I got out of high school. Went to the University of Arkansas. You know what I majored in my freshman year? Keg emptying. That's the truth. And I was so good at it, they made me a professor of the class. But I was godless. Intoxication 
is something that isn't to be laughed about. It is something to be looked at as a dearth, as a problem with our nation. Alcoholism. Man, you have these huge corporations. And what do they do? They have all these free classes and free rehabs. And everybody goes and gets treated for alcoholism. Then they have a company party and you have beer and you have wine and you have hard liquor flowing and it's not a problem. It's all expected. Same way with our politicians. It's drinking and it's drinking and it's partying and it's okay. You go to the Republican National Committee you go or Convention, you go to the Democratic National Convention. I know it's changed up this year, but I promise you folks, the alcohol flows. But yet we all talk about the Ter how terrible it is. And folks, when you talk to me about alcohol, in my counseling and in the time that I've talked to people, listen to me. You can give me all the verses you want to about how Paul told Timothy he need, need drink, drink it for his stomach's sake. You can give me all the different things Jesus turned water into wine. You can give me all the verses you want to about how it's okay to drink in moderation. Okay? But I'm going to tell you something. I've never, not one time, have I ever counseled with a couple or with a family or with an individual that has told me one good thing that's come out of their alcohol consumption. Yet I can tell you many Christians, many Christians, who have taken a stand with alcohol, not being belligerent, not being... Uh, offensive but have come to the place to where they said you know I think I need to take a stand on this because a lot of my friends and a lot of my society has a problem with it I think what I'm going to do is take a stand and just say as for me and my house we're not going to consume it and I'm telling you when your friends that are alcoholics and your people that are around you that are alcoholics and they come to you because they will They'll come to you and say, how did you do it? Can you help me? Because they're not going to go to another one that has a problem with it. They're going to come to you. But the main thing is, when a society embraces it in such a way that we have in America, it hadn't stopped at alcohol. That's where we have the problem with fentanyl. That's where we have the problem with morphine. That's where we have a problem with any of the pain-killing drugs, and they're all legal. That's why we have the epidemic we do. is because we have gone from one sedative to another, to another. Instead of going to God, the peace of all God, and praying to Him with all prayer and supplication, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall enter your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We don't go to God with it, what we do, now folks, I'm all for, I had two liver transplants, and believe me, I told Mitzi when I was hurting and I was in pain, I wanted a piece of duct tape. Because they had me on a pump, and you could push the button and it'd give you morphine or it'd give you what you needed for your pain. I said, get me a piece of duct tape, I'm going to tape that button down. I believe in sedatives, I believe in those things that are needed in medical science and for those things. But folks, we're not talking about that. We're talking about recreationally, they were drinking wine in bowls. When it becomes a recreation for a society, then God says, i got to stop it. It's killing them. The last thing. No remorse for iniquity. Look at it in verse 6. Who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the best ointment, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. What in the world is he talking about? What was Amos saying? What was the affliction of Joseph? You know the story of Joseph. I'm not talking about Mary's husband that had Jesus. I'm talking about Joseph in the Old Testament. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. And the greatest grievance of their sin was not that they sold him into slavery, but it's that 
they never felt ashamed or they never felt bad about it. Oh, Reuben did, but he came up with a way to not kill him, and that was to sell him into slavery. His brothers did not have any grief, any remorse for his affliction. 2 Chronicles 7.14 Barbara, how quick are you? Can you get it up on the screen? 2 Chronicles 7.14 This is a whole message in itself and I'm not going to preach it. But I want you to see this verse. Because it's, very, it's directed at us with this verse. Who have no remorse for the affliction of Joseph. That's talking about the nation Israel. It's talking about God's people not caring. They don't care. Yet when God established the temple with Solomon, He gave him a promise. And here's what He said. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Do you know what we're doing wrong, church? All these things I talked about, most of us sit and we say, yeah, that's right. The homosexuals get right. The alcoholics get right. If the people that are wasting, people that are uh, indulgent, people that are, that are lawless, if they'll just get right with God. That ain't what he said. That is not at all what he said. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and turn from their wicked ways. Then what will God do? He'll hear from heaven. It's us. The problem's not them. The problem is us. And what we do is we justify it. We sit here and we come to church. Well, you think coming to church is that that's going to help God? It'll, it'll, he'll, he won't, he'll be good to us, you know, since we come to church. No, he's saying you've forgotten. Your heart's not broken for it. You watch it on TV and we become so immersed into it and inoculated from it that it doesn't affect us. And God says, I want my people to come and I want you to pray. Now let me tell you, over the next 40 days or so, before this upcoming election and everything that's happening in between it, we're going to have opportunities for you to come and pray right here at this church. But the most important thing is that we do it at home. I want to challenge you. Just take 40 days. 40 is a great number. Remember the 40 days of of trial, that, of fasting that Jesus went through and then He was tried by the devil? It took those 40 days of prayer to pre prepare Him for that temptation He was about to receive in Matthew 4. Prayer. Man, get your neighbors to pray. Get your family to pray. Get people around you to pray. Get people at work to pray. Just make a commitment for the next 40 days and 40 nights, that what you'll do is you'll commit to prayer and pray for yourself first and say, God, convict me of the things in my life that I've allowed. God, change my heart. Make me sensitive to the things of you. Because we've been so desensitized to the things of God by the things of the world that the church that has gathered has come to a place to where folks, we just don't get it. The only way we're going to get it is when we spend hours in prayer. 
And we'll spend hours in a lot of other stuff that we do, but we won't spend it in prayer. And I'm saying we. I'm not saying me or you. I'm saying we. Because I'm right there with you. Let's make a commitment for 40 days. And let me tell you what's going to happen in that 40 days if we really do that as a church. That means every Sunday, it'll be different. That means these events we have coming up, both with the, with the roping and then having our special guests that'll be here on that Sunday, it'll be different. It'll be different. The power of God will be here like it hadn't been here because we haven't been praying. So devote 40 days and 40 nights. Here's what's going to happen too. After 40 days, 40 nights, you'll be different. I'll be different. And I'm telling you, it'll make a difference in our church. We'll see revival like we've always said we wanted. But revival won't come unless we repent of our personal sins and pray. When we do that, God will move. And we'll see something here at Living for the Brand Cowboy Church that the whole world wants. And let me tell you, we won't be able to keep them back. The world's so hungry for it, and they're not getting it at other churches, they can get it here if we'll pray and get ready. And I'm telling you, God will make a difference. He'll make a difference in our country. He'll make a difference in the election and what happens after it. It'll make a difference in everything that we do if we will just pray and say, God, I repent. Change my heart. Make me sensitive to your things. And I'm telling you, it'll make a difference. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving me a message this morning. I thank you for a church to preach it to. But I thank you most of all, Father, for Jesus. I pray right now for anyone in this room that does not know Him as Lord and Savior, that right now they'd call out to Him and say, Lord, save me. And then, Lord, I pray for those of us that are believers. We are children of God. Lay upon our heart the need that we have both in our country, in our church, and in our family, and in our own lives to repent and pray. Lord, I don't want judgment to come on this nation. I know Amos didn't on Israel. But Lord, I know you're not going to leave this thing unchecked because you're God. And I pray and I ask you, Father, to have mercy upon us. Forgive us for how we've lived and what we've done and choices we've made. Lord, I pray that for my life. And I pray, Father, that you would allow everyone in this room to leave today with a commitment to prayer. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to stand to your feet, and as soon as you get on your feet, I want to ask you to come and pray at this altar. Pray for our country. Pray for our election. Pray for our Supreme Court nominees. So pray that... God will have His will and God will have His way. But we ask you to come. Trey and Rod will be down here at the front and I'll be here too. But you come.